Two men are about to meet for the first time on television. But is it likely to be a meeting of minds? One is a loyalist whose father was murdered by Republican terrorists. The other, a staunch Republican who spent 43 days on hunger strike while in jail. In spite of their differences, they've agreed to be here tonight for a unique television discussion. Gary McMichael is leader of the Ulster Democratic Party, which has close links to the UDA. And Pat McGowan is a member of Sinn Féin's national executive. They share many differences, but do they share any common ground? Hopefully, we'll get the answer to that tonight. And if you have a comment or an opinion on the programme, we have a number for you to ring. It's a Belfast number, so the code is 01232 if you're outside the city. The number itself, 240500. Belfast, 240500. Gentlemen, there's been an open invitation uh, to come on Counterpoint. And for the first time, Sinn Féin and, and a loyalist fringe party has agreed. Why tonight? Why is the timing suddenly right? I don't think it's a matter that the timing is suddenly right. Uh, it's a matter of coming to a conclusion that uh, it is important that, as a, from a loyalist point of view, that our voice is heard and that people have the opportunity to see both sides of the, of the coin and listen to two sides of an argument. And uh, I'm here prepared to offer the loyalist analysis. But you weren't uh, in a position to do that previously. Well, obviously we have to, uh, we can only move as far and as fast as our communities are comfortable with. And uh, I think the time is correct now uh, to, to make that next step. And Papi and this is the sort of thing that Sinn Féin always says all they ever want is the opportunity to sit down and talk. So you have the opportunity. What are you saying to? Well, I think first it would be naive if we, if we were expected to solve all the problems that we face in, say, 20 or 25 minutes. Indeed. I think that this is a start, maybe, of an engagement. And, you know, be it on, on the media or be it in private, I think we have a lot of talking to do. But I think people also need to recognise that we won't necessarily solve everything as quickly as everyone would like. You know, there's also a counter-opinion, which I'm sure some of your viewers are watching, and for a two of us end up fighting with each other. The, I, I think at least the fact that we are engaging in dialogue publicly is a sign to all our communities that that's the way forward. But isn't it strange that you're saying, look, this needs a lot of time, this needs a lot of discussion, when your leader, Jerry Adams, is saying, crisis, we're not moving, crisis, we're not getting no, anywhere. I don't think that's quite what he's saying. What he's saying is the sooner we get into that discussion and that dialogue, the sooner we can move the thing forward. But, but I, I think our problem is that we haven't got into the dialogue. The British government are still standing outside the door. They're not engaging. You know, so it will take time, but I think we've got to take the first steps. That's the problem that we're facing. Okay, let, let me ask both of you, and I'll just start with Pat McGowan. What have you got since the ceasefires? I, I think from, you know, what we went in to the, the ceasefire situation with our party saying that we thought there was an opportunity to move the situation forward. But I think looking on, at it 18 months on, we also have to recognise there's a large amount of frust frustration in our community. W were there people now saying... There is no way to move it forward politically. Now, I see my job as a politician as continuing to search for the way to move it forward. The ceasefires give us the space, all of us the space to do it, and I think that we've got to use it. We shouldn't abuse the time that we have got maybe to take the first steps towards solution. And when your people are saying to you there is no way to move it on politically, what does that mean? Let's I, get back to violence? No, I, I, don't, I don't actually know, because the, the reality is that that hasn't come to the boil. But I think there is a large amount of frustration. There are people who are questioning whether the peace process will go forward or where it's going. I think what we're saying very clearly is we want it to go forward. We want it to keep moving and we want to see it successful. What are your people saying to you, Gary McMichael? Well, I think that the ceasefires gave everyone an opportunity, an opportunity that they didn't have before. And I think we'd recognise that the ability to find a political settlement to the problems in Northern Ireland uh, can we best achieve an atmosphere rid of violence, and the ceasefires achieved that. I think what is missing is that um, now uh, the situation has deteriorated, where people are actually sceptical as to whether uh, an agreement can be found, because we are, haven't moved into a stage of political discussion and political negotiation. Now, at the same time, you know, there's a lot of blame has to be led for that. It can be led at, at the feet of uh, in many corners. Uh, what is important now? is that uh, some integrity is shown and we don't have uh, people standing and saying if you don't agree with me there's going to be a return to balance if we don't get it our way there's going to be a return to balance if we don't get it the ira way there's no other way we have to find a way of getting into negotiations where 
uh, we can move forward and people can see a stable uh, and uh, are, are given an opportunity to have some faith in the integrity but of the process. <clears throat> you're saying that knowing that your team are, are still sitting there fully tooled up and the great majority of people in Northern Ireland don't want that. I understand that. I have to say from a loyalist point of view that the people who I represent within this peace process, and that's the loyalist power multi organisations, a vital component in this peace process. How, who's going to convince them that the time is right to hand over their weapons if they're not convinced themselves that the time will never come again when they'll have to defend their community from the IRA? But you're both politicians, you're both Democrats. Are you not hugely frustrated that these unelected, undemocratic, faceless people, the loyalists and the IRA, are holding you back? from doing your job. I think the, the unelected people who are holding us back are the British government who aren't elected in any part of this country. They're, they're the ones who have the key for to move it forward. I think the weapons issue is a sad issue because, uh, you know, I think Mitchell in his report is fairly honest when he says that it isn't going to happen. That there's still a lot of confidence to be created before people will move to opposition. You know, my community would say they don't want to disarm because they've been attacked in the past. And I assume that the loyalist community will have the same perception. So unless we actually deal with the fundamentals, the political problems, I think we're on loser if we keep running at weapons as being the problem. That isn't the problem. That's a symptom of a political problem. But the question that, that will be thrown back at you by the majority of people was, is the violence over then? If you're not prepared to hand over the guns, does that not imply there is a danger the violence is not over? Well, it's over, I think, if we can move the process, the political process forward. I think that's the guarantee that, that it's over if we can continue to move the situation forward. But is that not also a threat that if you don't, no, you it will be back to violence? It certainly didn't sound like a threat. What I said is we have a lot of work to do to move it forward, and I'm accepting that. What, what I'm saying is that, that that's the key to unlock the situation, that we move the situation forward. And if the situation doesn't move forward? Well, I, I think it's dangerous if we, if we allow stagnation to become embedded. Now, the decommission issue, it has to be recognised. Decommission is an important issue within the minds of ordinary people in this community, whether we like it or not. I don't think it should be as high on the agenda as it is now, but it's, it was inevitable because there was uncertainty about where, uh, as soon as the IRA uh, called their ceasefire, the main concern within the loyalist community was, has there been a deal done? And, you know, how long is this going to last? And I'm sure they're exactly the same um, concerns were there within the nationalist community whenever the loyalists called their ceasefire. Now, what has to be accepted? It, is, it has been the, the uh, frustration and it has been the distrust of the power of the organisations, which has led to the decommission issue becoming um, a manifestation of the fear and anxiety and distrust within the community. Now, therefore, I believe those power of the organisations have a responsibility, and the onus is on them also to uh, deal with this issue and be seen to deal with what the Commission is. It's lack of trust and confidence. Now, loyalist organisations have done uh, have won a great distance to try and address this. They have sought to reassure the nationalist community that there would be no initiation of violence. Yet, I have to make a very plain uh, and frank accusation. The IRA have done nothing to address my community, done nothing to address the unionist community, and done nothing to convince people within the loyalist community and the community in general, that this is for real. And that's a fundamental flaw. I think it's perceptions. You know, Republicans will say the IRA actually initiated this process of ceasefire. They were the first ones for to declare a ceasefire. And they've done it without any preconditions or without any conditions attached. Now, I think if you talk to my community, they would say that they don't really trust the loyalists. You know, so it's again a question of, that I, I think if we're expecting people to trust each other right at the start of this process, it isn't going to happen. That's why people hold on to weapons. The The reality is that, you know, someone said that actions speak louder than words. I, I think that what we've got to do is prove that we can move the political situation on. That will then create a confidence amongst, amongst both their peoples and allow them to begin to sort out their problems. Yeah, but I, I, I agree we'll have to move forward. But I mean, there's a couple of points, sir. I mean, the ceasefire, the IRA ceasefire and loyalist ceasefire that came after it, that wasn't the start of the, of the process. The process yes, was a long time before that. I mean, I've only got to look back to 1991. And for uh, almost two months in 1991, for the duration of the Brute Talks, mm -hmm. loyalists exactly. ceased violence. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the peace process, from a Republican point of view, wasn't the ceasefire. 
It was thinking 10 new fans. It was to engage well, on a, on a, on a, on, on a you, ferocious campaign. But you would accept that's a matter of opinion, Gary, and that we actually did, Sinn Féin did our peace process from 1987. That's whenever we began to work for to create the conditions to move it forward. Now, okay, you may have a difference of opinion on that, but that's whenever we began to work for it. The, the, what, what I meant when I talked about the IRA ceasefire, what was, that was a big move. That was a move that made, it brought it all out into the open that there was a potential for peace. But, you know, the thing about first strike, in our community, they would say first strike is okay with loyalists unless the union is threatened. Then first strike isn't the case. Again, it's a question of confidence. You know, that's the perception people have. So is, is first strike, first strike period? Or is it first strike as long as the union is still perceived to be safe? Let me spell it out very clearly. What was said in, uh, on the 25th of August of 1995 by the Combined Loyalist Military Command was that providing the rights of the people of Northern Ireland were upheld, there would be no first strike. Now, if you're saying that it is a condition that the rights of the people of Northern Ireland are upheld, their democratic wishes, consent, which is in effect what it is, the principle, a fundamental uh, basic democratic principle, abided to and subscribed to by all parties within the British Isles, exception, Fian, then it is a condition. But I don't think it's one uh, that can be, that any, uh, anything can be thrown at. It's a legitimate uh, statement of intent that unless uh, this process steps outside the, the, the mechanics of democracy, then Lawless will not initiate a return to war. Now, what have the IRA got to say about that? They haven't said nothing. But, but, you know, Gary, if you reverse it from our perspective, from a Republican perspective, the political unit is Ireland. That's the reason for, for resistance. That's probably the reason for a lot of the warfare that we've had for quite a while, the partition of Ireland. So, you know, what I'm saying is, again, we're approaching it from different perceptions. Now, I think one of the things that we start to do tonight is we, we signal to our communities, it's time to talk. It's time to get the thing moving. It's time to begin to work out the different perceptions and time for to begin then to deal with the real problems. You know, we can sit here slanging each other all night about who's going to be first strike or who isn't, but the reality is we've got to get down to the nitty gritty, I think. Okay, well, look, let me see if I can broaden it a wee bit because I think what most people still don't understand is how this situation came about, whereby one day the IRA, who for the modern IRA for 25 years, have been fighting for a united Ireland, and they say, down tools, boys. Six weeks later, their implacable enemies, <clears throat> the loyalists who fight to maintain the United Kingdom, say, well done, lads, down tools. You can't both be right. No, but, but I don't think it's a question of right. I think both sides were saying, look, there's a potential for to get a political solution here. Now, they were saying to people like me, go and do it. Stop messing about. Go and do it. Because that's what you've got to replace war with. You've got to replace it with the political process. So I think both sides, in a way, were making space for, the sol for a political solution to come about. So you think that Republican violence had taken the Republican movement as far as it could at that time? And, and to use a, a unionist phrase, you had to go the last mile politically? No, look, well, you, you, that, that can be a perception come from unionists. That, well, my view would be that Republicans were given it an opportunity. You know, and it isn't the first time Republicans have done it. It also isn't the first time that Loyalists and Unionists have done it. But they were given an opportunity to move it out of a phase of warfare into a phase of politics. Now, I think the sorry thing about it is 18 months on, that opportunity hasn't been taken by all parties involved. And I'll do the calls in a second, but Gary McMichael, two ceasefires in six weeks. What did you make of it? Well, I mean, it's uncharted, uncharted water for everybody. But what has to be recognised here? is that this peace process is supposed to be about resolving the political differences and finding a reasonable accommodation of a political settlement in Northern Ireland. Now, the opportunity was afforded to do that at the time of the ceasefires. That opportunity is deteriorating, is disintegrating. Now, uh, what we can't have, and this is why, I mean, I keep coming back to uh, what the, the organisations, what the paramilitary organisations on both sides have to do, is because people, you know, people don't trust them, people don't trust the process. Uh, an opportunity was given, but they just, they just trust that opportunity. Uh, what we can't have is for the lowest organisations or the IRA dictating terms of where the peace process lies. It has to lie uh, within the bounds of uh, all the people of Northern Ireland. We don't own this. You know, I mean, uh, shortly before Christmas, Jerry Adams told us the peace process was over. 
What right is he to tell anybody that the peace process is over? It doesn't belong to him. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to everyone. Right. I think he's right to have an opinion. You know, the, 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 and, and that's what he was doing, giving his opinion. It was a very strong opinion. No, but let, it's an opinion. Let, let, let me get through a couple of these calls. A male from Whitehead describing himself as Protestant stroke loyalist. Both gentlemen deserve a handshake for coming on the program. A call from Derry wishes democratic politicians would talk the way these men are talking on television. Maybe then we would be further on. A gentleman from Bangor, a question to Pat McGowan. Does he think the murder of Gary McMichael's father has advanced the Republican cause in any way? I'll get back to that in a second. A school teacher. Uh, both parties, why will you not decommission weapons? Teacher from a mixed school. A uh, call from Belfast. Uh, who elected? Between the two of them, they speak for only about 10% of the population. And an ex-loyalist paramilitary. Do you believe the main obstacle to all party talks is the mainstream unionist party, not the likes of the, the fringe party? So, Pat McGowan, there was a question to you. Do you think the murder of Gary McMichael's father advanced the Republican cause? I think it's probably an unfair question in this situation. I think it's maybe somebody looking awry. But besides that, the, uh, I think, look, what we all know is we, we have all been hurt in this conflict. You know, Gary's been hurt. He lost a father. I've been hurt. I've lost family and friends. So we have all been hurt. What, what I think both of us will agree on is that that hurt shouldn't have been for nothing. That, that should be our motivation to move the thing forward politically to ensure nobody else gets hurt. So I don't know if that's an acceptable answer, but what I'm saying is, as opposed to us dwelling in the past, I think what we've got to do is give hope for the future. Well, I mean, everybody has suffered, but I mean, I, the way I look at the situation is, I mean, it's the experience that I have because I'm a father that, that brought me into politics in the first place. So in that respect, that, I think that has been a positive thing, although he'd be a, a do a far better job uh, than I, that I'll ever do. Uh, but there are so many people out there who have suffered. There's another three and a half thousand people who lost their lives in this conflict. What I'm committed to do is to do everything in my part to try and ensure that we don't move back to that type of situation again. Because who really wants to have a war? And who's going to fight that war again? Uh, it's going to be ordinary working class people. Now, what we need to do is to create the conditions where that cannot happen again. And the onus there is on everybody, it's on the politicians, it's on the government, it's on the paramilitary organisations, it's on the guy on the street to do everything in their power to make this process a meaningful process and make it work. Okay, 25 years, over 3,000 people died. You yourself were prepared to starve yourself to death. What have you achieved in 25 years? What has the Republican movement got that it couldn't have had 15 or 20 years ago? Because well, uh, the cynics will say, well done, Pat, you've nearly got Stormont back. Well, I, I think what, what you've got to look at is the, the modern Republican movement was born largely out of reaction to the state that we had 25 years ago. Now, much has changed from, from the, the days of the old Stormont Parliament. The, the thing about it is we haven't resolved the problem because we know unless we resolve the fundamentals of the politics... But we, we, you know, maybe not this generation, but some other generation could be back in war. So I think in terms of what's been achieved, I think today what's been achieved is we have probably taken the first step to, towards a permanent and lasting peace, and that we are at least begin to build some understanding. You know, Gary talks about the unit of democracy being the North of Ireland. I talk about it in terms of being all Ireland. Now, if we get locked into talks about then how we try and begin to reconcile those views and accommodate each other, then that's the way forward. Same question to you. There could be those who would say to you, well done, Gary. 25 years, 3,000 dead. What have you achieved? You've got Stormont back where the working class loyalist doesn't have a voice. Brilliant. Well, to be perfectly honest, uh, I don't think any uh, decent working class person would want to see a return to Stormont. And I think all this talk about returns to Stormont and Stormont type setups is, a, you know, it's a complete smokescreen and has been used all over the place. Now, what we have to do is to establish a process of negotiation of which all those participants in those negotiations subscribe fully and exclusively to the democratic process and to the outcome of that process, and that's an issue in itself, and uh, where we create a society in which people in Northern Ireland can share this territory and live and work together with equal power and responsibility within their own society. But again, we come back to the question, it was one raised by one of the callers when he said you got 10%. Well, Sinn Féin, with, let's say, 10 to 15% of the vote, you are what, 1% at the most, the PUP, similarly, very, very small percentages of the vote. The power base, surely, for Sinn Féin was when there was a ballot paper in one hand and an arm light in the other. 
and similarly for you? Well, <laughs> I mean, you're, no, well actually, combined, you're representing what one in seven of the population. So, if six of, and out of seven of the population say, ignore them, what do you do? Well, if I can make a point here about this, first of all, my party's participation in the peace process is not based upon our electoral strength. It's because we represent a, uh, an important constituent element within the process of conflict resolution. And that's that is, that is one of the, that's the terrorists. We're honest about it. Yes. Okay. We're, we're being that. honest about it. Yeah, but what if the majority of the because you're a Democrat, what if the majority of the population turn around, for example, on the on the prisoners issue and say, let them rot. Throw the keys away. As a Democrat, do you not have to accept that? I have to accept that there are ranging views within our society. Now, the Lord's position, let's look at that issue, let's look at prisoners. Prisoners are an important element. They have been a very important and crucial element in bringing the ceasefires about and maintaining the ceasefires. Now, at the same time, let's make no mistake, there's another important element out there, and that's the victims of, the, of violence. And what release of prisoners is supposed to be is, uh, a is, is, is a means of helping normalise our society. Those people wouldn't be there if we had a normal society. They're there because of the political situation here. But at the same time, it's supposed to heal, be a process of healing. And but the difference between ourselves and people think that ourselves and Sinn Féin agree uh, wholeheartedly on the issue of prisoners. We don't agree with opening the doors and letting people out unconditionally, because I think it's ins insensitive. I think it's it's flying in the face of the sensitivities of those who are victims, because it's supposed it's we what we shouldn't be doing is embarking uh, on demands which will result and actually widen divisions within the community and, okay. and further in distrust. And if the majority of the people within your context, the old Ireland context, said, lock them up and throw away the key, as a Democrat, would you not have to accept that? But Mike, you know, this thing of the majority of people has almost become that because the majority of people say, then I can't hold an alternative political view. I'm, I'm quite entitled to it. Indeed, but, but then how do you, how do you but resolve I'm, no, that? But I'm quite entitled to continue to argue yes. my political view. Uh -huh, but I'm, asking you know, I'm quite entitled to believe different. And just because a majority say doesn't mean then that I have to scrap all my beliefs. No, but I'm saying, how do you? It's your difficulty, not how do you argue that? If you're sitting there, for example, with 15% of the vote, and that would be Northern Ireland. I mean, on an all Ireland basis, it would be bound to be less than 15%. What I'm saying is, that does that not give you a great difficulty arguing your position? Because presumably there has to be a decision. You let the prisoners out, or you have a phased release, or you don't. Right. And if 85% say don't, how do you go forward? If we actually look at it, and we, we base it in reality, the, the, majority, the majority of people on this island, the government that represent them, is releasing prisoners. You know, so it, it actually, it's a hypothetical situation you're throwing at, which is contrary to what's actually happening. How do the prisoners feel about the, the $500 a plate fundraisers in the States? You know, the Dickie Bow night out. Is, is that not very contrary to, to Sinn Féin's socialist philosophy? I think prisoners understand that we have a case to make in the US, we have a case to make to the important people in the US, and if that's the way you get them into one room for to make your case, then that's how you do it. You know, there's a different perception, different concept of how politics works out there, and I think that's one of the mechanisms that you use for to get your case across. So it's a pragmatic rather than a, a principled be, approach. You know, all our politics have to have some pragmatism in them. I wonder about the fact that here we have the UDP sitting down with Sinn Féin and the PUP going to Dublin. Now, you wouldn't go to Dublin, and I don't know whether the PUP would sit down with Sinn Féin. Well, uh, to, to be quite open about it, well, first of all, uh, we weren't invited to go to Dublin. Uh, secondly, uh, it's a matter for each party to determine what uh, way they approach uh, particular circumstances. But I, I believe that I am here and I am arguing the loyalist position. Uh, I am doing so because my position, uh, I have no fear of, of my position, and I'm quite prepared to argue it anywhere. Okay, let me just say that uh, the only way forward is sitting down together, and this caller from Newton Abbey applauds both of you for doing so. A caller from Belfast, good to see them talking. It's the people who have been killing that need to talk directly to each other. That is not to suggest that these two gentlemen specifically have been responsible for that. Uh, a caller from Newton Abbey, why are both parties afraid of an election? Uh, how can Republicans see this as a situation that has to be solved by 32 counties rather than six? It's a pity we cannot find a Sinn Féin representative who will reassure people that there will not be a return to violence. Uh, we'd love to know from Pat McGowan of Sinn Féin IRA, don't get their ultimate peace solution, brackets United Ireland, 
would they return to violence? And a Belfast caller wants to know if they won't have party talks. How can the younger people look up to them? I'm afraid because of the nature of live television, they don't get a chance to answer any of those questions, which is very undemocratic. We had an awful lot of calls tonight, and I'm sorry we didn't get through them all, but I would like to thank uh, everybody who uh, has phoned in. We will certainly study all your calls after we go off air tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank Pat McGowan. I'd like to thank also Gary McMichael. Thanks to you for your company and, as I say, for your contributions tonight. That's it. Back next week. And from the Counterpoint team, good night. <laughs>